this is a, uh, a view that was uh, taken in, jeez, uh, I forget the year, I think 1890, but it just shows you the neighborhood as it would have looked when the Stanleys got to town. Um, the Stanleys are a, were twins who grew up in Kingsfield, Maine, the home of the Stanley Museum today, who have been very helpful in giving us the images and, and these free books and other information. If anyone wants to go to Kingsfield, Maine, great little museum, and there's uh, also something in Kingsfield which is the Maine Hudson, how do you say it, Trails and Huts? It's a, a nice system of walking between huts so you don't have to lug your camping gear, but you get a, a great walks in, in quite wild territory. They didn't give us anything, so that's just a great plug for your benefit, I think. Um, okay, Wheaton, here he comes. Um, we're starting here at uh, Cross. We can't see it from here. But we'll, the first thing we walk by is the Honeywell Club. Um, which is a building that the two Stanley brothers, I don't know, how many people know about the Stanleys at all? And how many people know it's not, the Stanley steamer is not a carpet cleaning machine? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I ask people now, a lot of young people never heard of the car. They say, oh, doesn't that clean carpets? <laughs> so, I mean, we got to have more history, uh, history <laughs> sessions. Um, I'm going to focus on, it's, this is really isn't about so much about the cars, it's about the family, and, and it's about one of the twins, uh, Frank or Francis Edgar Stanley, and, and his neighborhood and his family and the houses that he was connected with, just because we are limited, our time is limited. The other brother, uh, Friedland Oscar, Great names, uh, all from, from from Maine, and they came from a long line of uh, people with a lot of uh, pride from the, the hills of Maine. And the, you see it in the names of the children. There's a there's a genealogy chart somewhere in, in one of the uh, publications that the museum probably has. Were they, were they identical twins? Yeah, yeah. identical guys. They. Both born on the same day, as a matter of fact. <laughs> uh, the 1st of June, 1849. So, uh, without further ado, why don't we start? Uh, All right, this is our first example of the, uh, the Finnish style of architecture that both of the brothers had in their homes. Uh, it's called, and I'm not an expert, what is it called? A colonial Revival? It, these were built, this one was built in uh, 1898 as a men's club. Whoa! I don't know why that happened. A, a teetotaling men's club for recreation without liquor, which uh, I don't know the details, but that obviously had some importance for it doesn't sound like much fun. the Stanley Brothers. Uh, but they, they actually built it, probably had a hand in designing. Um, Frank F.E. Stanley, uh, yeah, Frank, Frank Stanley, um, was an ingenious kind of inventor from Maine. And uh, with, well, he started out as an artist. Um, and we can look at, uh, we can look at picture one. Uh, oh, wow. This is uh, this is a picture he took. Now he started out as an artist, but he got into photography uh, in the 18 uh, oh gosh 18 uh, does it, does it yeah 1880s 70s. I have to look at my notes, and I'm not looking at you. Uh, and this and and then they got into manufacturing the the glass plates that they used in those days, you've seen them in the old-fashioned movies, every single picture had to have a glass plate slid in the camera 
and got exposed, and it was they were coated with an emulsion that uh, is what made the picture. That's actually how they. That was their most successful business was manufacturing these glass plates, and they started doing it in Maine, and their business was so successful, they moved to a water town where they set up their plant to save shipping of all the materials up from Boston to Maine, and then the finished product had to be shipped back here. And I have the feeling they were probably, uh, you know, excited to look at a, live somewhere else besides Maine, and they really got into uh, living in this area, era, and area when uh, it was a kind of a boom time in the late 1800s and early 1900s before World War One. Okay. Uh, oh, this this photograph number one is Frank Stanley jumping a puddle, and it was really part of an advertisement. One of the reasons their plate business was so successful was it was a quicker. It didn't take as long for the picture to be taken. And, and he was demonstrating that by it catching somebody in mid-air. And uh, isn't that clever? Yeah. And so they built a better mousetrap and made their fortune. Um, picture number two shows the artist uh, as he, uh, a self-portrait when he was in his 20s. In, eight, in the 1870s. Yeah, that adds up. So, okay, let's uh, let's walk a little bit. No, let's look at number three. It's a nice shady spot here. This is just another example of his art as an artist. This is a crayon drawing of his daughter Blanche. And some of these homes will be a couple of these three. I think we go by, there are three locations in our walk that Blanche lived in. This was his first daughter. He and his wife, Augusta. And, uh, okay, well, uh, while we're still here, let's look at number four. Got number four. Now this, this one, of, one of his other inventions that I think was primarily FEs was the airbrush. He, he started getting bored with how long it took to do the regular paintings and crayons. So he took an atomizer and blew drops of paint onto the canvas and has a patent in 1876 for the airbrush. So which is, I mean, this this guy, both of these guys were Yankee and Confederate. And that's the theme of this booklet that the museum is is offering to 12 lucky Tourists here today. Okay, now we got to. Yeah. Do you know what that house is now? Condo. Yeah, condo. So I've lived here 33 years and I did not know the origin of it. When we moved here 33 years ago, it was a community service center. Oh, right. And 15, 15, 20 years ago, they uh, it got sold and divided up into condos. And when I was a, a kid. Room on the top floor. Yeah. It had well, a and bowling alleys yeah, in the space. That's somewhere. right. And I, when I was a kid, you too. We used to set them up before they had a lot Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, it still was a kind of a community club. Uh, John and I went to dancing lessons. Yeah. And Paul. Jo yeah. Up in the ballroom. With, with, uh, well, we could go on and on. Um, all right. So we'll walk now. We're going to go up to the end of this road, turn right, and then turn left and go up the hill to Center Street, and if anyone wants to ask questions as we walk. One more thing about the photographic business yeah. is that they made, they at one point were George Eastman's last large competitor, and they were almost as large as George Eastman was after he'd swallowed up everybody else, yeah. and they made a fortune by finally selling out yeah. George Eastman. Yeah. Oh, really? Did everyone? Uh, further up this street, on the left, Number 261 was the second home of Frank Edgar Stanley, our guy for today. We're going to leave it as an option because when you come back down the hill, if you have a little more energy, you can go up and look at 261. Is that the one with the turrets and things? No, it's 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 not a it's not a very dramatic building. Um, who's got number five? 
Okay, this is actually the first home of, um, it isn't the first, it's the first home of the twin brother. We don't have any pictures of the, uh, the first home of Frank, but I'm guessing it's similar to this. And you can see in these three types of homes, mm -hmm. they kept getting upscale. So this is the most modest, and it's, it's, it's not shabby at all. I mean, it's all run down at this point. But and where was that located? That was over near the uh, the plate and, and tar factory off of Galen Street. Was it in Watertown? It's on Jefferson Street. I think it was Newton. 31 Jefferson Street. Anyhow, I don't have a picture of the one up here because it's here. Uh, but if you're curious, it's... Uh, it's there, and it's also the one where number six, we have picture number six. <laughs> Great. This is their young son, Raymond, who was actually born in the house on Franklin Street. And then he later built the house <clears throat> up the road in the compound that, that we'll see today. Hey, Ken. Yo. There's a couple of family names yep. around here that people might recognize. Shaddix lived here. Shaddix? That's an old Boston name. Oh, right. And the Angels lived two houses down here. Anybody who knows anything about Newton history, the name Anger. Anger's Corner was the old name for Newton Corner. <laughs> and and Bud, Ralph Bud Anger used to live in a little house. That's right. A little old house. Very terrific guy. He was our Cub Scout leader. Yes, he was. <laughs> <laughs> these, these guys here, by the way, this is Paul, John, and Julie Radigan. We grew up together, and they lived in one of the Stanley houses that we'll be seeing today. So we're not going in any houses, but... If you have any questions about how many fireplaces there are or something, <laughs> I'm sure they try and remember. Okay, so we do know that uh, that Frank wrote some uh, some pamphlets or articles. You know, he had a moral sense of of uh, you know things he believed in, and he wrote some articles. And they, I'm sure, the museum could direct you to some of those, and there might be information in there, but it's nothing I've gotten to. Yeah, yeah, Temperance came and came and went, and I'm sure they didn't do what they did without being able to focus a lot. Okay, this little house, the last one before uh, the next street, just it's just a house that was given to one of the daughters, Blanche. Blanche was the oldest daughter of, of Frank and Augusta, and at one point this was her house, and. Then um, around the corner, the second house over there, which is number uh, 21 Bennington Street, this belonged to the sister, Chansonetta. Chan great name, huh? Chansonetta was the younger sister of the two twins. And she's noteworthy. Oh, you know, number four. She's, she's on number, she's the subject of that airbrush. Number eight shows one of her photos. They're, they're quite dramatic. She did a series of kind of folk life, home life in the Maine. And uh, I find them just striking, striking photos. Um, and number seven shows a picture of her at the piano. So she lived number, uh, what did I say, 21, just, just down Bennington a little, and we, we won't cross the street. And, uh, okay, right, and by the way, yeah, refer back to 21 if you haven't seen it. This is a rendition of the neighborhood uh, at the time they, before they built their houses, give you an idea. And that's something on your way back if you want to cross the street at your own risk. Uh, and, uh, Look for number 21. Okay, um, this is the site of Frank Stanley's uh, finest home. And you will see that number nine, number nine and number 10 shows, shows the picture of that house, which they moved into in 1886. 
it uh, it was quite grand, but but it was it was again built in this colonial revival style, which for those times was somewhat restrained. This was the era of the Queen Anne um, Victorian uh, painted lady homes with all the turrets and the different colors and. And these guys kind of stuck to something that was a little more classical with, uh, we're, we're not looking at it here, but uh, with columns and palladium windows and things like that. Anyhow, on this corner is where this wonderful house stood. But it, uh, Frank Stanley actually died fairly young. Um, if you look at number, uh, oh, let's see, number 22, <laughs> uh, Frank liked speed. He he made his his photographic process was faster. His uh, airbrush did things faster. The Stanley Steamer cars won all sorts of races early on. In fact, they end up some of the competitions such as Daytona Beach changed the rules to exclude the steamers because they. They walked away with all the awards compared to the internal combustion engine that, that have, hadn't been developed enough to, to beat them. And uh, Frank died in 1918 in a car accident where he uh, swerved off the road to avoid running into a wagon or something. So he was, uh, what was he, 60, almost 60? 49 to, uh, was he 68? I'm not doing the numbers right. So it was 50 plus 18. Yeah, you're right. So he had a good life, but, but he did, uh, and this home, uh, at this, by this time, the, uh, I think they, the, the Stanley Steamer car business was bankrupt and they sold it to a couple of people, so they, they did have money problems. His, uh, his widow and his daughters, uh, they ran out of dough. And this grand old house in the, I forget when they tore it down, mid-30s, I think, it, the maintenance on it was just too horrendous, and they ended up tearing it down, selling it to developers who built two houses on this corner. Okay. At the time of, I, I can't remember which one of them is buried at um, Newton Cemetery, but um, they must have had a little bit of money still left oh, yeah. because they've got a lovely monument there. Isn't, isn't the next house up the street a Stanley house too? We always thought the next house was a Stanley house, but it turns out it is not. It, they never lived there. It is a country. I'm not sure of that either. Might be. It's stucco. There's a, we'll go buy another house, which is number 650 Center Street, and it's a grand house. You have no idea how many people I drove that was standing. I know it. Well, me too. Um, we, growing up in the neighborhood, that's where John Simpson lived, and we always thought John Simpson lived in the Stanley house, but picking, getting some facts. That's not true. That house is interesting, however, because it's the only house on the whole block that was not in the Stanley family. It was built by a lawyer named uh, Freedom Hutchinson. And, and it looks like a Stanley house. It has a lot of the same features. In fact, if you look at the uh, attic, um, what are those bump out windows? I'm blanking. Dormers. Dormers on the attic, they're very identical to photos number 12, which shows a garage that was part of the compound. Now maybe they were just common, I don't know. The lawyer that, li that, uh, that built this house that we thought was Stanley was did spend some time in Lewiston, Maine, the same city where the Stanleys uh, were artists and entrepreneurs. My, I'd like to imagine that this was a friend of theirs, maybe even a lawyer, a close friend, and that, that that's how he got the land. And, and I know Frank for sure, I think both of them liked to do the designing. 
This house here was done, uh, the credits are to Frank as designer with the help of, a, of an architect in the city. So that's what I like to think. This Stanley house was related, but there's a little bit of a mystery there if somebody is interested in researching. So let's, uh, we'll just continue and we'll walk past 650, take a look at it, and then we'll turn left on Garden Road and get away from the, uh, the highway. This whole block here was Frank Stanley family compound. And uh, I forget when this 650 house was built. Um, it wasn't there on the 1907 map. If you look at uh, pictures 19 and 20, these are from two old maps. Uh, one is 1907. All right, so this this block here is the compound, and uh, this first house is the newest one. This is the one that Raymond Stanley, the, in the soldier picture number uh, six, he built it for himself. He actually became. I don't know why it does that. He actually became an architect uh, after he got out of uh, World War One. And uh, so that he built that. And those other two houses we're, we're seeing from the back, those are the two famous concrete houses that uh, Frank built for his two daughters. Blanche on the right and Emma on the left. And it's Blanche's houses that the Radigan family lived in during my youth. And how many of you are here now? Four of us. Four of us. I have joined the tour. Raise your hands and if you're willing to take questions, uh, that'd be great. Um, which, which house was this? Those two. Those two. Yeah. There's a, and we'll, we'll go around and see them from the front. I thought had another house over there. Well, she did. She had, we walked by one, but that, you know, she outgrew that or, or that, she had that but while these were being built, let's say. So what, what's this? Well, this is Raymond's house. But this, that's this, not what, this is the side of the house? or is Oh, that this is the front of this house. Yeah. yeah. It's the side, it's, it's the original it's house? It's the actual house built in, uh, I think, the 30s. Okay. I mean, he was a, he was a late child. They oh. have two daughters, and then Raymond came with a 10, 12 year gap. It's, okay. it's in my notes, but I, I don't want to look at them right now. So what else? So Raymond was grandson to the no, yeah. no, he was the son of Frank. He was Frank Fe's son. As a matter of fact, if you look at plate number fourteen, there's a picture of Frank and Augusta with with young Raymond. They, uh, you know, it was really a family operation, and uh, uh, you know, Frank took care of his daughters and and. Uh, F.O. took care of the sister, who, who was widowed at a fairly young age, and uh, he ended up supporting her and, and uh, helping her pay for the rent at the uh, Bennington house that we didn't actually go by. So this house over here, was that part of it, or was that the Hutchinson house? That's the Hutchinson house. This, this is the Hutchinson house that on the 1907 map wasn't even there. No. And then you can see in the 1917 map, it's there with the name Freedom. I think they spelled his, his real name is Freedom with an M. But it's spelled wrong on the map. So one other item that uh, was just between this house and those two was a garage. That's sort of famous. It's plate number 12 handsome garage that was three stories and they had a ballroom on the upper story and they had a lot of family gatherings there. That's long gone, um, but this is the one where the, um, the dormers on the garage look almost identical to the dormers on the Hutchinson house. Coincidence? I don't know. I'd like to think Frank had a hand in in designing it. And it might even be another concrete house, though. I've never heard that, so that, that may not be true. And then one other plate 15 shows uh, shows the two daughters. 
And plate 13, I should have showed you sooner, is, is Frank and Augusta when, uh, I don't have a date with me on that, but that's when they were younger. I think that might have been around the time they got married and, and they were still in Maine. Okay, what, well, yeah. Just a, 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 a little aside, uh, there was an Italian gardener when we were growing up named Tom. He used to come up, walk up the Newton Corner, work in this area, return back every night. And he didn't speak English very well, but I got him talking one time when I was a little older and cared about history a little more. And he came here in 1927 when the mansion was still here. And he told me about the, the, this garage, which was quite unusual in that it had a ballroom on the second floor for entertainment. And on the first floor, it had a round table like the, the turntable like the railroad. And it was an eight-car garage, and they had eight slots, so they could drive directly in and then turn them around and drive them directly in. There were conduits, uh, utility conduits to uh, at least those two houses, maybe this one also, that carried all the utilities, gas and electric. And it was all fed in, and, and uh, Frank picked up the tab for the entire block. Wow, I didn't know that. Thank you, Paul. Can well, you say is... something more about why he made concrete houses? Um, well, and how is that as a building material in our climate? Good question. I don't know a lot about that. Um, it was a new method, and they were they were interested. Oh, we got answers over here. Go ahead. No, you go. <laughs> When he went to build a building on Hunt Street in Watertown for, their his for his factory, they poured the foundation. And then when the workmen came to build the building, they refused because it, the, the foundation had been, not been done by the union men, by the contractors. And so they were going to charge this exorbitant price or not do it at all. And so the brothers said, don't do it at all. And they went ahead and built the first concrete building in the United States using concrete and the forms themselves. And that's why they fell in love with concrete buildings. Thank you. And they sort of embellished the story and said that the new owners discovered that it was concrete. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, of course, we knew it all along and passed it on, but um, it, it, John, I think, has the big chart. I mean, the big uh, copy of the Globe article. Oh. Made a, made a better story. It did, yeah. yeah. It did, yeah. Okay, one, the original hide, this was, before the Stanleys, going back into the 1600s, this was hide territory. There was the Hyde Farm and Hyde Avenue and, and children of Hyde. I think the street, this, this garden road was once called Rebecca, which I think was a child of Hyde, and George Street was the father's, and children's name. The old farmhouse was still here in 1907. And when Frank started turning it more into a compound, they moved it. And at that time, and today still, it's one of the oldest houses in Newton. And it was moved right across here. None of these houses were here. And it's now on George Street. And I, geez, I forgot the number. But it's... Um, Next door to 19. Next door to 19, whatever that is. And you can you can see it, it stands out as an old farmhouse compared to the other buildings there. That would be extracurricular too if you want to detour that way on your on your return home. Oh. Well, the hide house, right? Well, I think there's a picture that says... Maybe it should be the hide house. The hide house. From the, from the hide farm. So, what was you, the side of the garage? It was kind of in the middle of the block, okay. kind of between between this house and, and those two. If you look back on, when you were yeah. well, no, we never saw it. Oh, okay. Did you did, did you see the foundation? The foundations. I'll bet you it's still there. I never saw the foundation. Yeah, yeah. No yeah. kidding. Yeah, you used to be able to see it from here. I just walked into the driveway a little. Yeah. The top block. No. Oh. You might be able to see it from the other side. Oh, the God. And the whole complete all. The no, size? there was one wall with a stairway going down. Yeah. That was all this. I'll be darned. Yeah, so. Again, looking at that garage, which was quite a grand garage, number 12. Uh, and there's another photo here. Oh, I see. If you if you look behind the garage, you can see these other a piece of these other two houses, which is how how I located it here. Okay. So these guys got into. They they made an X-ray machine. Uh, in the 18, 
1897, they had a patent on an x-ray machine. They didn't invent x-rays, but they made a machine that, that doctors would send patients out from Mass General to... Uh, that, was, that was faster. The Curies only discovered, and, uh, discovered the existence of radiation in 1896. Oh, well, that doesn't add up, does it? That's pretty quick commercial. 1897? Well, well, maybe. Yeah. And they, as a hobby, they made violins. That was an old family uh, recreational activity. And uh, Paul says they're quite good quality. And Paul is a piano technician, so yeah, he should know. They're considered the equal of some of the finest uh, Cremona violins. Is that right? And they're highly prized and extremely valuable today. FOs, not FEs. Is that right? Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. aha. Uh -huh. Well, FO. Into his retirement, he uh, actually, I think, after the, the car business went south, he and his nephew uh, Carlton spent a lot of time making violins. In Newton Corner, and throughout their entire lives, they always had a little workshop, a little work table. Both of them made violins in their spare time, if they had any, inventing all that they did. Yeah. Uh, they would work on violins as just a passion, a personal passion. They liked to keep busy. Yeah, yeah, so they did. And they did probably had plenty of time if they didn't drink. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I, that, that's the airbrush, the, the x-ray, the car, and the, again, they didn't invent the steam engine or anything, but they engineered a car that was quite successful using steam. And uh, car buffs uh, would debate whether it could have been more successful if they had, I know why, when I hold this in front, that's why I get the sound. Yes. Yeah. And on, on uh, plate uh, 17 and 18, you can see some Stanley steamer cars. This, it's kind of a classic picture. The, one of them was taken in around the 1890s in front of a house. I don't, I forget where it is. You know where that is? Okay. And then, oh, neat, neat. And then they took another one uh, 20 years later with a, one of the newer models. Late 18. So I guess, um, again, there's several more houses. I hope I gave you enough information if anyone wants to walk more, so you can you can see them. So did they both live here when they died? They both lived in Newton. Yeah, they they left Maine and uh, no, spent the rest the of their lives. Didn't live in Newton when he died, did he? What's that? One went to Colorado. One went to Colorado and opened up a hotel. Yeah, well, F.O. had a lot of trouble with tuberculosis oh. throughout his life. And he started going to Colorado in the summers for his health, and he really liked Estes Park area. Yeah. Built a hotel, and uh, so he never lived there permanently, but he would go back and forth. And he was actually in Newton in this house on Green Street, which Green Street off of Waverly, Green Park. Green Park. It used to be his driveway, and then it got turned into a street and was developed. He actually died on the doorstep coming out for the newspaper one morning, as the story goes. And uh, it's, it's my recollection that the, uh, uh, the, the hotel he built in Colorado was uh, the site of the uh, filming of the movie The Shining. I've heard that too. Yeah. I think there's something true. One other little tidbit about that hotel. They actually designed and built some uh, Stanley vehicles, which they called wagons, something wagon. Station wagons? Well, they didn't call it that, but it, uh, I don't have a picture of it. But it was a wagon that could hold 10 or 12 people. And they used it particularly for the hotel to drive people back to and forth. From the train station. From the yes. train station Hence to the, the hotel. Yeah. And the Stanley Museum, there's an there's a auto museum in, uh, in Maine, another part of Maine, um, Cove, Seal Cove. I think has one of those wagons. And then there's usually a steam day up at this Seal Cove Museum, and they'll give you a ride on the... I had a ride a couple of years ago on the... Are these are the ones with the million doors? Uh, they might have had a number, yeah, number of doors. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think I'm running out of things to say. But if anyone has any questions... Uh,